I think at heart I'm uh, I'm still a hippie. You know, maybe I'm a rich hippie, but I'm still a hippie, and I've never really worked hard at manipulating my career into one area or another area. It just seems like, um, and then also being a religious person, it just seemed like the, like the hand of God all my life was just kind of directing me here, whether I wanted to go or not, because there's times in my life where I didn't want to do this. I wanted to still be on stage playing. <laughs> something we were we we were brought up to just have a a love for it was always around the house there was always an instrument somewhere to play there was always someone to play with you and uh, um a, a, a lot of people that, that that have cared to know anything about me know a lot of this so i'm kind of giving you the reader's digests uh uh cliff notes version but yeah i was lucky i played with a lot of big bands a lot of I played with the four tops the supremes when i was uh early teens and um, played with some of the uh, guys in Skinner, which led to a, a little stint with them after the plane crash. So it was a neat time. It was a good, it was a good learning experience because what I'm doing now in terms of mixing, it, 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 it showed you how music can affect and really move people. So when you're sitting in a room like I'm sitting now and you're doing a mix, um, you can mix it technically or you can expect to come out of those speakers, the things that move you like they moved you back then. And uh, that's a good goal when you're mixing. And uh, one of the things I like about Waves plugins is it gives you that uh, ability to go beyond and transcend what you're given and, and to actually uh, incorporate some of those feelings. You know, like there's, there's, there's pieces of equipment uh, in the analog domain and the hardware domain that um, that just have they're just kind of infused with the musicality. I don't know if it's because of the personality of the owners, but I'm um, I'm guessing that that a lot of the waves uh, or all of the waves uh, products are infused with the personalities of the owners, and that's why they have that ability. I think to uh, uh, to to allow you to 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 transcend what you're given. When I say transcend what you're given, like you're looking at a piece of this console, we've got a collection of drums and, and keyboards and instruments and vocals. And my job is, is, is to just make that sound good, be able to hear all of it, be able to recreate what the producer had in mind, the person that wrote the song had in mind when they originally conceived of the song. And at that point, really your job is done. But most of us that do this, that, that come from a musical background, we try to take it another level and, 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 and make that touch you in some way. You can't do it with every song. It's just not possible, but um, it, it's worth the effort. And a lot of times you succeed, you know? Um, and that's, that's what's really fulfilling, to be able to, to be a part. You can't, I can't take credit for it, but I can be a part of something bigger than what I'm given you know like there's songs that uh, that every human being I don't care where they are will hear and it just it just evokes a rush of feelings and emotions and um, in some small way I think that's a uh, part of the contributions of uh, of what I do for a living beautiful uh, Christina Aguilera uh, when I first started that mix uh, I was sitting there thinking you know what people are going to really realize I'm the world's greatest mixer when they hear this. And I'm thinking, man, this is amazing. This is really good. What an incredible song, an incredible performance, and what an incredible mix. Started listening to it, came back to it a little while later, and I realized that uh, it's completely wrong. I realized that what we were trying to sell there was this incredible melody and lyric and couple that with one of the great singers of our generation. And all I'm sitting there doing is trying to get a great mix out of it. And so when I uh, tucked my ego aside, I rolled some high end off the piano and uh, uh, Linda Perry and I uh, 
we decided to make it sound like Imagine, John Lennon. And um, so I had to um, kind of lo-fi everything, you know? In other words, I had made it sound too good to the point to where the mix was overshadowing uh, this wonderful f performance and song. And, and now one of the things that I'm proud of, it, and it's, 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 it's an odd pride, but you couldn't tell me if there's live drums or programmed drums, if there's an acoustic guitar in that song. And you've heard that song a, a million times. All you remember is, damn, that, that bitch can sing. And uh, wow, what an incredibly powerful song. So the essence of that song was to remove my ego as a mixer from it. And uh, I can't think of a greater example than that because everything in our bodies wants to make us, um, I won't necessarily say show off as a mixer, but you want it to come out of those speakers and just have your, your compatriots go, wow, ooh, Dave, Dave nailed that one. But, but when I did that, it, it, I'd have to play it for you just so you can hear how funny it is. I mean, it's just, it's just it's, it's silly. But how many times do we do that in a creative domain where we, we, our egos force us to inflict our own personalities onto something which actually need, need nothing? They, they were, you know, they're great the way they are. And uh, that's the biggest stumbling block I see. It's a difficult time to break into the industry, but uh, I can highly recommend my job. If you, if you want no life, if you want no social life, if you want your dog to bark at you because you're a total stranger when you come home at night, and your child to ask her mother, who's, who's this guy hanging out this weekend with us? If you enjoy all of those things, then, then mixing might be for you. It takes a total commitment, so it's 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 a uh, it's but it but the rewards are are incredibly great, you know, in terms of uh, uh, it, it's a lot like a doctor that saves a patient. Sometimes you just you just feel good about about your profession. When the first synthesizer came out, everybody huddled around it, and the guy plays a string note, and everybody in the room goes, "That doesn't sound like a violin." And I'm going, I know that's great, isn't it? I've got a violin. Give me something that doesn't exist. That's what I'd love to hear from a synthesizer. And pretty much everybody uh, heard drum machines. And they're like, that doesn't sound like a drummer. And I'm going, I know that's great, isn't it? And I, so I made up this little saying just to kind of piss people off. Um, you can't say piss in a Waves interview. Okay, just to upset people, I made up. Just to upset people, I made up this little saying, it's better, it's better to sound new than sound good. And uh, what that means is um, if everybody on the radio has got live strings and real drummers, come in there with a synthesizer and, and a drum machine, and you're going to take the radio over, which is basically what happened. And um, music was better for it because now we were able to use all 52 cards in the deck prior to synthesis in the digital domain, we only had half the cards in the deck. One of the things that drew me to Waves was um, they didn't look like the analog equivalents. They didn't sound like the analog equivalents. They allowed me to do things I couldn't do in the analog world. And I think that's a, a basic tenet of the company is, is, is to invent new things. Uh, one little quick piece of history. Uh, Roland decided to make a drum machine that was kind of inexpensive. And so they didn't want to spend a lot of money on it. And there was this little Japanese guy over in the corner, bright kid, and they said, go, go make a drum machine. So he goes in the corner. He didn't know what drums were, apparently. Had never heard them or paid attention. So he goes in his little corner by himself and he makes this thing that became the 808 doesn't sound anything remotely like anything you've ever heard that's, that's anywhere near a drum kit. Like the cowbell, who knows what the hell that is. And the, and the kick is just, a, is just a sine wave and the snare is just awful. But those are probably the most heard drum sounds on the planet. If, if, you, if, you know, if you've been exposed to music on any level, you've heard about the 808 kick drum. It's, it's just, uh, if you've not heard it and, and you're listening to this, it's it's just it's just a poof. I mean it's just a sine wave. There's really not much to it. But my point is this: when our industry finally 
gives that little guy that doesn't, that's never been in a studio, doesn't know what any of this stuff is, and says, go make up something cool. And that little kid comes back with something that allows me to psychoacoustically change a sound. And that sound makes you feel something you've never felt before or, or whatever. That's when it's going to really get exciting, you know? Uh, I think there's different ways to apply the rule of thirds to the audio world. Like, like in the visual world, we like to see um, our, our paintings, our photographs. We like to see, we don't like to see the horizon in the middle of the photograph. We like to see it a third from the top or a third from the bottom. We don't like to see our subject uh, eyes right in the center of the shot. We like to see it on the third or a third. So that for, for those of you that aren't familiar with that concept, basically just divide the, uh, uh, your, your piece of paper or your canvas or your whatever into equal thirds horizontally and vertically. And that's called the rule of thirds. Uh, I'm not going to give it away. Let's leave something for you guys to figure out yourselves, but figure out how that applies to the, um, uh, to the to the audio world, mixing world, find my email address on the internet and email me. Let's get a discussion going about that because I think that's a good thing to explore. And I think if I give you the secret right off the bat, um, what's the point? You know, I might as well just drop by your house and do your mixes for you. If you look at the history of creativity in, in any genre, whether it be music or painting or ceramics, ideas seem to grow quicker than the the physical technology to produce them and right now i think um we've got a lot of ideas but right now the technology hasn't quite gotten there for these new ideas to manifest themselves and uh, i think we're on the verge in the next two or three years of a, of a really great musical explosion and i think it'll be um a little bit outside of what we consider the current business model now and I'm, 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 I want to be ready for that because I can't wait for that that's going to be a, a wonderful time it's going to be um, it's going to be heavily plug-in driven um, DAW driven uh, we talk about in the box it's, it's going to be seriously in the box you know and, and it might even be in the boxes who knows Max Bass is just one of those plug-ins where uh, there's not a lot of knobs, and actually there's a couple of knobs on there. I don't know what the hell they do, but I move them around and they sound good. Uh, but that's a very useful plug-in to... Um, what I find a, a use I love about it is sometimes I'll get a bass part that's almost a sine wave, and what that means is there's not a lot of harmonic content. So you put it on your big speakers and man, you're rattling everything in the room. You're, you're going, wow, I've reached the pinnacle of low endness. And then you put it on your smaller speakers like the NS10s and you cannot hear it at all. So imagine what's going to happen if that song gets played on TV. So uh, up comes Max Bass. You can actually get um, that low sine wave to have a, a harmonic component that's in tune that will that you can hear it on the small speakers i use it a lot for that so it gives you the best of both worlds you're still f fat and sine wavy on the big speakers like the producer conceived it but when you go to the little speakers you can still hear it we've got this little joke that we use we we've got uh two track tape machines that uh um that we print to uh, although less now than before and those have these little three inch speakers that are mono that are just used as utilitarian but sometimes we'll monitor through those speakers in mono just to see if our mix is going to sound good on tv we uh we refer to it as listening to it on prison radio and uh, we'll listen to the to the mix on that and man people just freak out when they can hear their bass on that uh when they you know when they haven't heard it on anything that small since they conceived the song so max bass is that's a great use for that plug-in. Uh, great, great plug-in. I think if anybody that's been in this business more than a year already knows L1, it's uh, it's just a meat and potatoes. Um, if you're familiar with old gear, it's like an LA-2A. It's just a, a couple of knobs and, and just a workhorse. 
I like it. Um, sometimes I'll put it after a regular compressor. So I have my regular compressor do the musical things, like kind of keep my vocalist in my face. And then I drop an L1 after that compressor just as a, a final uh, brick wall, you know, to keep, um, to keep that vocalist in check a little bit. I do that a lot for lead vocals, and uh, it it gives a uh, it gives a very musical um, extra limit to the compressor above, and and you really hear neither one. But working in conjunction like that, they work they tend to work really well together. Like like use a Renaissance for your first one, and then maybe only a three to one, four to one ratio, something real small and don't knock off more than about three or four dB and then put the L1 after that to catch the big stuff. And don't be afraid, you know, one thing we've forgotten to say, and I'm glad I thought about this, don't be afraid to automate anything on all these plugins. Like I automate my compressors a lot because they'll be, I'll have them set right for the verse, but here comes the vamp and they're screaming their heads off. Just automate it, just automate everything. Uh, I, I automate damn near everything on every plugin I use, particularly EQs and uh, and flangers. Um, don't be afraid to automate anything. That's one of the uh, one of the great tools we have available to us now. That's underutilized is the automation of compressors, and um, um, you can really, especially when you start, like I, I, I love to combine, I love to chain effects like I've, I've already kind of mentioned. As you start automating that stuff, whew, it's just it's just the sky's the limit. A lot of those things, um, I think I've said, said somewhere before, I used to race motorcycles and my motorcycle was a dirt bike, weighed about 200 pounds. And we would spend any amount of effort and money to get rid of half a pound of weight. And people used to ask me, oh, that's just so stupid. Can you feel a half a pound? I'd go, of course you can't. But if you do that 20 times, you, you've now decreased the weight of the bike by 5%, you know? So you can feel that. Uh, you can feel uh, 10 pounds. And mixing is a lot like that. If you just do a little automation here, a little plug in there, uh, you've only lost half a pound and you're not going to feel that. But man, you do that 40 or 50 times and now you've got a significant difference in your mix. You've got a dis significant difference in the weight on that dirt bike. So don't think of a lot of these things and concepts as in and of itself. Think of it as combined part of a bigger whole and then you can really start making a difference to, to your mixes at home, whether you're working at the level I'm working at or, or, uh, Lord knows if you're working at this level, you know, and you're buying this tape, you're hurting anyway, but, um, uh, uh, working at home, you can, you can, you can, you can, you, you can, and I'm telling you this sincerely and honestly from my heart, you can do just as good a mix as working at your home as I can here. It just takes a few years of trying and being blessed with, with good taste, you know, and, and figuring out what 14 year old girls want to hear on the radio. Uh, but it's totally possible to do, uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, there was a song called, um, Miss Independent, Kelly Clarkson. There's not a single outboard piece of gear on that mix. I'm, I mixed it at Rhett Lawrence's house. Uh, 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 an engineer named Steve McMillan and I, worked on that song together and that's all in the box and i'm telling you that sound that mix sounds great on radio so you, you you can do it at home you don't need all of this this is fun and it's cool i'd much rather have it than not have it but it can be done at home it just takes an effort l3 represents um a whole new concept in plugins it's it's a smart plugin it actually goes and looks ahead in the mix and says, uh, okay, look, this bass note's getting a little out of control here. It's about to come up. How do you want me to deal with that? And phew, when those guys are just off the hook coming up with stuff like that. Um, I, I mean, you know, hopefully that's the future and I can't see how it wouldn't be, you know, plugins that, uh, that are smart, that think, yeah. Uh, uh, Q clone, I've seen it. And uh, I, I think that's going to be 
a very unique, incredible thing. That's a good concept because it allows you to own a lot of vintage stuff with a small amount of, of uh, cash outlay. The reason I'm probably not as excited about it as I should because I got all the vintage stuff. But if I didn't, that would be one of the first pieces of equipment I would buy. But the L3, uh, that's just pure genius. And I think that that represents the future of our industry. I mean, reverbs that can think you know, uh, EQs that can think. In a way, if you automate the side chain on C1SC, you've got a smart plug-in, you know? So it's just a matter of time before the guys at Waves, you know, start doing more stuff like that because, <clears throat> I, like I say, I think that is the future. And, uh, in fact, I hoped it is. But Yeah, that's an incredible plug-in. Something to keep in mind, um, there's two ways to listen to what I'm saying and what anyone says in terms of uh, their opinions about music and how to create it and how to do it. Uh, you can you can listen to these specifics that they say and go and try those and apply those to your skill set. And that's cool. That's good. But when you hear interviews like this or read them, uh, try to philosophically understand what caused that person to want to try that particular thing or do that and, and incorporate those in your skill set. Because it's music, we sometimes think that we can hear something and immediately apply it and immediately get the same results. That can be the case, but more often than not, you need to experiment. You need to try these things that you hear other engineers say and it's not going to give you instant results the way it does us. It, it, it seems simple, and I'm not sure I can explain why that is. I just know when I was learning and when I was coming along, there was a magazine called REP, Recording Engineer Producer. I would devour that thing, and I'd try everything these guys said, and my mixes still sucked. And um, so as you're listening to this, and I'm saying particular things, think of it on two levels. Think of it as, okay, I'm going to go try that, that C one SC and let me see what it does. If it doesn't do exactly what you think it should do, don't give up. Keep working on it. And and as you're working on it, you're going to find that, that not only will you be able to get it to do what I get it to do, but you'll do it better and you'll take the whole process of mixing to another level. If you build your career solely based on what you read and hear, you're just going to be a carbon copy. And, and right now, carbon copies aren't getting paid that much, nor are they really getting hired that much. So try to find a spot within the industry that's uniquely you, uniquely yourself, and you'll go through what I went through. There'll be times when early part of your career, people go, uh, man, I need you to do a mix. Can you make it sound like, and then plug in flavor of the month mixer. That used to torture me. Now people ask me to sound like myself, which sometimes is an equal torture, but um, try to find a spot within the industry where the competition isn't as great and start there.